Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're going to cover the intestines of the horse, which I think is one of the more complex intestines that we have to work with in domestic species. There's a lot of different components to it, but in this we'll cover the both the small and large intestines and we'll take a piece of food and track it from the stomach and follow it as it goes throughout the entire intestinal tract of the horse. Hopefully after this video we can better understand how the intestines are oriented in the horse and uh, use this diagram to show some of the problematic portions that uh, cause pathological issues in the horse as well. So if we start at the cranial side closest to the head, we'll have food in the stomach. And this food is going to make its way to the distal section of the stomach in this region. And this is called the pyloric region of the stomach. Okay. We're not yet in the small intestine, but we are at the pyloric region. Right over here, where we have the yellow is the starting point of this small intestine. Right around here, we will see the starting point, really, which is the cranial duodenal flexure. And that's the starting point of the duodenum, which is the beginning of the small intestine. I guess before we go through everything, I'll, I'll briefly touch on all the different parts and then we'll talk a little more in detail once we get there. So in yellow, we have the duodenum. That's the first part of the small intestine. In red, we have the jejunum, which is the second part. And in baby blue, we have the ileum. So that's all parts of the small intestine. Then we have in green here, that's the cecum. Some textbooks refer to this as also part of the large intestine. Some refer to it as a separate section. So this is the cecum. And the cecum in horses is very large. Well, if you were looking at a diagram, uh, it's, it's much larger than what you would see in the other domestic species. And really, it's very extended. Then we have in blue here, and in purple, these are parts of the ascending colon. These are the large intestines, the starting of the large intestines. And uh, we'll talk about the different parts of those once we get there. Then in black here, we have the transverse colon. And up here is the descending colon, the ending of the large intestines. Okay, so let's get back to where we were with the food. The food is now leaving from the stomach and entering into the duodenum. In the stomach, we have gastric pits, a different type of epithelium. And once we get into the duodenum, we'll have different types of villi that are going to demarcate essentially the beginning of the small intestine in the duodenum. The duodenum has different sections as well. As we move caudally, the food is going to move down the descending duodenum. Once it gets to the end of this descending portion, it's going to go from the right side of the median plane towards the left. And whenever this happens, we call this the transverse section. So this is a transverse part of the duodenum. Then the food will start going cranially again. And this is the ascending portion of the duodenum. Right around here, where we have this inflection, this has a name as well, and it's called the duodeno jejunal flexure. And this will be the ending of the duodenum and the starting point of the jejunum. Before we move on from the duodenum, we'll just talk about this major landmark that we have here. This landmark is a mesentery that's basically connecting the duodenum to the descending colon. It's really important because when you open the abdomen, if you're confused at what you're seeing or trying to orient yourself, these are the certain landmarks you want to look for. And this is one of them. So this we call the duodenocolic fold. And it's really easy to see if you're tracking from the duodenum, trying to figure out where you are, you'll see this fold and that'll show you where the descending colon is. So now we've moved on from the duodenum. The food has now made its way past the duodeno jejunal flexure and we're into the jejunum. The jejunum, just like other domestic species, is this long intestinal tube 
that allows for more time for the food to become digested and the enzymes to break down and be able to finally absorb the nutrients. But it also uh, has a lot of important lymphatic structures that are going to be inside this mesojejunum. So this is all mesojejunum, what I'm tracing here in gray in the inside. And this is helping anchor this long and bendy jejunum so it doesn't get all tangled with other components of the intestine. Inside this mesojejunum, we'll have lymph structures, and these will be really important for helping detect invading antigens or anything like that. Once we get into the ileum, and if you were to look at it under histological slides, you'll see that the ileum is actually even more important in detecting any types of antigens because of the Peyer's patches that are in there. But basically, uh, at this point, what we'll see is we make our way from the jejunum, the food has traveled through, further broken down, and finally we'll get to the ileum. We know we're at the ileum once we see this ileocecal fold. This ileocecal fold will extend from the cecum towards the ileum, or from the ileum towards the cecum, and it will connect the two, and we know that we've reached the end of the jejunum or the start of the ileum once we see this fold. Once the food leaves the ileum, it will go directly into the cecum. The cecum is a little different in horses as well because it has two openings. One where the ileum will project food into the cecum and another opening right here, which we call the cecocolic opening or the ostium, where the food will go from the cecum and exit into the ascending colon. So that's how it's a little different. But basically, the food will come in. This cecum is huge in horses, like I mentioned before. The food will go all the way around the cecum and then make its way to the exit of the cecum. In other species, food didn't have to travel through the cecum to make it to the ascending colon. It could go into the cecum, but it didn't have to. But in the horse, it has to go into the cecum before it can make it to the ascending colon. Also, because the cecum is so large in the horse, they've called it, or they've attributed three different sections to the cecum. We have the base of the cecum, the body, and the apex of the cecum. Great. So leaving from the cecum, we're entering into the ascending colon, the first part of the large intestine. The ascending colon will have these different ventral and dorsal sections to it, in the ruminants and in the pig, we saw these spiral-like structures, the centripetal and centrifugal. Centrifugal, we don't have those in the horse. In the horse, we have these dorsal right and ventral left parts of the ascending colon. So the first part we're going to start on, we're on the right side. So the first part is going to be the right ventral colon. I'll draw this in yellow. It might be easier to see. This right ventral colon will take the food, and it's going to get to this flexure point. The flexure here is actually very close to the sternum or the diaphragm. Let's say this is the diaphragm, but it's also close to the sternum as well. So this flexure point, we're going to call the sternal flexure. So this right here is the sternal flexure. And like we said, this is the ventral, the right ventral colon. It's going to make its way through this transverse section, crossing from the right to the left side. And now we get to the left ventral colon right here. So I'll mark that right here. So now we're at the left ventral colon. The left ventral colon is also going to have this inflection point, this flexure right here. This flexure has its own name as well. We will call this the pelvic flexure. So I'll write that here because it's near the pelvis. So that's the pelvic flexure. Now the food is going to continue. Instead of being on the ventral, side, it, this pelvic flexure is going to force 
the colon, the ascending colon upwards. And now it's going to become the dorsal colon. So we're still on the left side. So now we're at the left dorsal colon. I'll mark that here. And again, we're going to reach this flexure. This flexure, in this case, we're further away from the sternum. So we don't call this or refer to this as a sternal flexure. We call this the diaphragmatic flexure. And the food is going to continue. Now it's going from the left side back to the right side. And it will enter again into the right section of the ascending colon, but this time dorsally. So we call this section the, wait, let me draw this clearly. Let's just put it through. So this side is the right dorsal colon. And remember, this is still all part of the ascending colon. So that's the right dorsal colon. Right here, if you can see, we have a swelling in this region. This swelling is, uh, has a different name in the horse. They call it the ampulla of the colon, of the ascending colon. And it's this enlargement just before the food goes from the ascending colon into the transverse colon, where it narrows. Here we have a narrowing of the transverse colon. This becomes more narrow. And the food has to, from this larger opening, force its way into this narrow transverse colon. And then it'll run again, transverse from the right to the left, and make its way into this descending colon, where it'll finally get close to the rectum and then out the anus. So that's the, the path that we have for the food in the horse.